This is a Rook Media series, The Contemporary History of Iran, Part 33. Welcome to the Contemporary History of Iran, a series from Rook Media. This is part 33, Shooting the Revolution. I'm Gian Gomeshi. Our aim with this series is to explore the events, personalities, and issues that have shaped modern Iran. We want to do this as much as possible through a non-traditional lens, through snapshots of change and using alternative voices or angles. This series is mostly in English and will feature a new episode posted on selected Thursdays across our Rook Media platforms. We will post subtitled excerpts with Farsi Zirnavis on our YouTube and Instagram sites. We are coming to you on rookmedia.com. It is there that you can link to all of our platforms, and we invite you to check out parts 1 through 32 of this series that are already posted. To become a sponsor or patron of Rook Media, please contact us through our website. All right, let's get started. Here now is the Contemporary History of Iran, part 33. Mention of the Islamic Revolution of 1979 in Iran immediately conjures images of massive crowds, protests and crackdowns, a Shah being sent into exile, and an Ayatollah catapulting into power and consolidating his base. But while the revolution was televised, the actual international media on hand were limited. It was a pre-internet and social media age. There were no digital cameras or smartphones capturing the action. In fact, the documentation of the final days of Mohammad Reza Pahlavi's rule and the first days of Ayatollah Khomeini's return is found in a few famous photographs and video images that forever define a time of epic upheaval in Iran. Interestingly, many of the most definitive photographs of this period were taken by one man, an American who was quite young at the time and photographing for Time magazine. His first-hand impressions as a witness to history shooting the revolution are invaluable and instructive. David Burnett is a legendary photojournalist that American Photo Magazine has named one of the 100 most important people in photography. He's an award-winning American photographer who's covered some of the most important events around the world in recent decades, including the Islamic Revolution of 1979 in Iran. Mr. Burnett spent 44 days in Tehran during the final era of the Shah and the coming of Khomeini. He documented everything related to the fall of the Pahlavi dynasty and the birth of the the Islamic Republic for the eyes of the world to see. His work from the revolutionary period was published extensively in Time magazine, including its Man of the Year portrait of Khomeini. Mr. Burnett is the author of a book entitled 44 Days, Iran and the Remaking of the World. He's the co-founder of Contact Press Images, a New York-based photojournalist agency. And right now, David Burnett joins me from New York City today. Hello, sir. Hi, uh, good to be with you. It's a great pleasure. Thank you so much for doing this. And I know I told you earlier, I, you, you've done so much in your career, it feels amiss to only focus on one period of your work. But for the purposes of this conversation, uh, we're going to zoom in on your time during the Iranian Revolution and your book, 44 Days. Well, that's fine. And actually, you know, every now and then, I just, uh, it's one of those things, when you're a photographer, uh, you kind of live in two worlds. You live in the world of the photographs that you have and what's happened to them and how people react to them. And then there are those moments that are just living on in your head that kind of come back randomly. It isn't a terrible thing, but it's kind of interesting that 
like there will be moments that I just can remember being somewhere in Tehran. And I haven't, unfortunately, I haven't been able to get a visa to go back to Tehran in some number of years. And um, so... Well, it's kind of an I, amazing thing because you're you're both documenting history, but in a way you're documenting your own history as well, right? Well, it becomes, and especially when this is what you do for your whole life, which is more or less in uh, the 50-odd years that I've been a photographer, that's kind of been the only real job I had and and there are times <laughs> times when it's not really a job it's just it's an affliction or a desire but it's what you know photographers like uh, journalists and artists are kind of driven to do what they do I think and so I I love having been able to have had a whole life in which that's been my credo just always trying to find the next good picture well you certainly found what you're what you're good at i i don't know if you're good at a lot of other things but you're definitely good at this and i mm-hmm. i i even think about how i was thinking in preparation for this interview and looking at the photographs i i, I called them iconic in this case the word does apply they really are iconic and i think of the iranian revolution now and i have ever since i was a little kid uh, through your images, because mm-hmm. they are they they had became so popular that it is literally the way many of us living outside of Iran saw the revolution and in the years afterwards. So before we get to you being in Iran, which is mm-hmm. fascinating to me at that time, I want to set the stage for you before you got to Iran, because it, it and what your thoughts about Iran were. You were a kid from Utah, um, mm-hmm. and <laughs> even though you had a poli sci degree and you were pretty well traveled as a young photographer what was your impression say of iran before you landed there on christmas of 1978 well for a long time i kind of i'm a little bit over you know now i'm not a 24 year old kid wanting to go absolutely everywhere tomorrow which i think uh, a lot of my uh, my friends and i in this business we combined the wanderlust along with whatever ability or talent we had as photographers to try and see the world and it was really a lot of it was about having a chance to see places cultures uh, vistas things that you otherwise would never have seen at home when the Shah came to visit with President Nixon in the summer of 70 either three or four I think it was 73 actually it was one of the first things I did that summer, the Shah came uh, sort of shopping with a lot of petrodollars to see what kind of uh, arms that Iran could buy from the Americans. And that's, I think, that was the trip where he flew in the F-14 out, you know, when you, the new Top Gun Maverick movie. Right, right. Well, the, fir- the first one where the original Top Gun was F-14s, and if you can imagine... The Shah, who I'm told was a pretty good pilot, but uh, <laughs> flying around in the backseat of an F-14 trying to determine it. And I think those airplanes are actually still in service in the Iranian uh, Air Force these many years later. But that was kind of when, on my little personal radar, I think when Iran kind of first turned up was the Shah and Faradiba coming to the White House and... Uh, that would have been the first time I really thought, well, maybe at some point I'll go there, but I'm not I'm not going to rush. Then it ended up taking me six years to finally make so, it. So, yeah, you didn't you didn't go to Iran before this uh, 1978. No. And it's interesting because from what I understand, you're in Pakistan on an assignment and it finishes and you um I mean, it's it's so ironic, given that you become this chronicler of history, that you end up um, being at, at, at that place at that time, because it was quite whimsical. You decide to go to Iran uh, at Christmas 1978, right? Right, yeah. I mean, I tell this, this story with great relish, just as I think back to how lucky I was as a photographer to be able to be in the days... And this is the hardest thing to explain to anybody under 30, like that there ever was a time that there was no email, there was no cell phones, Mm, there was no Twitter, nothing like that existed. And if the editor called your house and didn't get you, maybe you would get lucky and they'd leave a message on your answering machine. And if you were traveling, 
you had your little beeper that you would phone into your own answering machine and hit your beeper and try and listen to the messages. And anyway, that one particular phone call, I happened to be there, and the Time photo editor said, well, come in, I want to talk to you about something, kind of hush-hush. So I go into his office, and he closes the door, which he very seldom did. This was like, ooh, this is secret. And he said, yeah, yeah, I want to send you and a writer to Baluchistan. I said, great, that sounds really exciting. Where is it? <laughs> right. And he said, I don't know. <laughs> and we, <laughs> and went, but he said, once I had said yes, we kind of wandered out into the hall where there was a big National Geographic map, and we found Baluchistan on the map. And you know, within a week, I was on a plane to Karachi, and I ended up spending several weeks up there. And that was middle of December. The one thing you never wanted to do as a freelance photographer is to waste a good airline ticket. Right, right. You're already like in the region. Just, yeah, yeah. I had just flown halfway around the world, and that's about as far as you can fly. The thing is, while we did not have cell phones and internet and email, any of that, we always traveled with a little like bar of soap sized shortwave radio, a little Sony shortwave radio. Mm. And you would be able to listen no matter where you were on the 1925 or 31 meter band, you could tune in to uh, BBC World Service or uh, Voice of America. Uh, through those BBC announcements, the, the news on the hour, I had heard building uh, along in, in that month that there had been some references to the fact that there had been, I think it was a fire at a theater in Tehran, and a lot of people died. In Abaddon, Senor Rex in Abaddon. Abaddon, yeah, yeah. yeah. And there were people who were demonstrating in the street, and I'm thinking, well, I, you know, let's, why, you know, I'm not going to go home, and I probably won't go to India. Let's just go to Tehran for a few days. Literally, it was going to be like three or four days. And it was Christmas, so there's nobody was around, really. And I just bought a ticket. Uh, uh, Karachi, Tehran, you know, it's an hour, what, an hour and a half flight, maybe two hours, and get to Tehran, and I've got this big envelope of film that I've just shot, and I walked over to the Pan American when there was still Pan American Airways, you know, in the era of film, which was existed really up until the last 20 years, you had to, you couldn't just be a photographer, you had to get your film right. to a place right. where something could happen to it and it could be seen. So I go to the Pan Am office right out by the parking lot of the airport at Maribad and unaware of the fact that that day was the last day that Pan Am flew into Tehran because things were starting to be a little bit dicey and they were beginning to suspend flights wow, wow. into and out of Tehran. So and you'd been I, through, I mean, even though you're a young guy at this point, you're, you'd are you already been to Vietnam, you'd been in some conflict mm -hmm. zones, but I, yeah. I'm guessing you couldn't, you didn't have any idea of what you were getting into when you got to Iran. Within hours of arriving in Tehran, you actually take a photo of a gun battle in the right. streets. What sense did you have of what was happening there? In those days, the Time magazine didn't have their own full-time reporter, but the chief of the Associated Press Bureau, and AP, you know, they're worldwide. They're, they've got people everywhere. And the, the AP uh, bureau chief, uh, Parvis Rain, it was his name, lovely guy, ran the AP bureau out of his house. So I, I had the address, and I got in a cab, and I got over to his house, and I'd been there about 10 minutes, and the phone rings, and... He said, they're shooting in this fun square. So he hangs the phone up, and with another uh, Associated Press photographer, an English guy, we hopped in a car, and essentially within like an hour and a half of landing, I was in my first street confrontation. Wow. And there was, you know, at one point there was some shooting, some people were wounded, were put on the back of motorcycles and driven off to hospital. Um, at one point, a soldier was grabbed by people in the crowd. They were trying to to just hold him back, and I think they were basically trying to steal his rifle. But um, it was just one of those things that I came away from that afternoon thinking, like, this is serious stuff. Th mm. They're not kidding. These people are ticked off, and this is not just some little 
you know, we're protesting uh, bus prices going up by five cents or right, something. Right. This was a much deeper. And then every day you would try and find out where things were happening. A lot of stuff happened around Tehran University. And there would be days when we didn't really have a beat on anything going on. So we'd go to uh, Leon's uh, downstairs cafe and have some blini and caviar and and sort of figure out our next move wow. <laughs> you, you know it was like well as long as we have nothing to do let's have lunch you know i mean there was that was really the deal because in, in point of fact you never really knew when you were going to be able to get another meal so and the fact that the caviar was so great okay that was a whole other yeah there's thing. no photos of you with the caviar but there's no a, and, and there's i a, didn't do that every day i don't want to there there are a lot of photos of you with with of not of you but that you take of crowds um, right big crowds no, and, the big demonstrations were really were really something i don't uh, think i'd ever been to anything where a million people had shown up yeah i want to get to the big demonstrations but even even before yeah. that when you're doing the crowds in the streets i'm just curious mm -hmm. if you give me a sense of if you can put it into words how, how would you describe the atmosphere of the crowds at that time was it anger well, was it excitement was it irrational was it diverse you know well, there was there there was a lot of chanting you know there that's and that's kind of thing where I'd seen in Argentina, even in Washington sometimes, but never quite as, you know, the, the crowds would start chanting, you know, Magbasha, Magbasha, Magbasha. I mean, there's like, the, I still hear these tunes in my head mm. where, you know, 40 years later. And, you know, it's like I spoke basically no Farsi other than maybe I think I could say, yes, I'm a news photographer. I mean, that was about the extent of my my uh, and and of course the key thing to to know which always amuses my iranian friends when i tell them that the first thing i had to learn was mustarim you know because it paid it didn't pay to have your own car when the demonstrations were going on because you didn't once you get to the first place and you get out of the car and the demonstration starts moving you would never be able to right, find the car right, again right. and and the phones didn't work and so you were kind of stuck out there so if you would stand on the side of the road and just kind of do you know uh, what the french call auto stop you know hitchhike and yell mustarim as the cars would go by especially if you're like a kind of a western looking guy with four cameras and a bag hanging on your shoulder people would stop out of if nothing else curiosity mm. and you know you'd go up one kilometer and then you'd get out of that car and get on the other road that went uh, east west and get another you know one of my french friends used to used to describe it as well you know we're gonna get a mustarim we go down here a couple of kilometers <laughs> and we get out we get another mustarim we go we finally find the demonstration i mean that was it was so seat of the pants now that yeah. Again, it's one of those things you can't even really explain to someone who has grown up in this world of constant communication and always being able to be in touch. How would you describe were, the makeup of the crowds? Were they, was it young people? Was it, uh, was it a mixture, men and I women? I would say all ages, really. It was, and, and the place, I mean, I, I, I have these very distinct memories. The first few days when the cops or the soldiers would be chasing crowds, and the kind of the teenage and 20 year old kids in the crowds would start running and they would be chased. And most of the time in those, especially in the first few days that I was there, they had a big smile on their face. There was like, there was a sense of a gaming, a, a game to it. You know, it's like, well, we're gonna run and they're not gonna catch me. Hmm. And, and I can still see some of those those young faces in my uh, in my head who you know they would all be in their 60s now but one of the things i always found was i never ever even as you know the an american you know magbar america you know it's like but okay i'm just the american photographer here i am i never felt threatened in those crowds people were only helpful i, was, I think they appreciated that we were trying to uh tell their story and, well, the uh, the hostage crisis hadn't happened yet, but no. but the Shah was associated with 
America. Uh, yeah, I, sure. I thought I heard you say in one of the interviews you've done in the past that you that you would sometimes say you're a French photographer. Is it- I did. I did. My French was pretty good, and I would say either French or Canadian, just because the first first morning I had been there, the bread at breakfast at the big hotel at the Intercon Hotel, the bread was terrible. And I knew Iranian bread would be really delicious. And I asked the front desk where there was a bakery and a couple of blocks away. And at like 7.30 in the morning, I went and was standing in line. To, you know, the bread that goes into the oven with the, the hot stones planted on it. And then sure. when it's all baked, you grab the bread and you bang it on the inside of the of the uh, oven and it knocks the rocks off of it and you have, you're left with this beautiful, beautiful bread. I was in line and just, um, I made the mistake really of just saying, oh yeah, I'm from New York. And immediately this guy, uh, you know, not aggressively, but it was just like, why is Jimmy Carter, you know, Jimmy Carter, the Shah is a bad man. Why just Jimmy Carter? Why are you, you know, it's like, and all of a sudden I was having to kind of take the role of, being the uh, State Department and in charge of American policy. And it was just like, I can't do this with every conversation and every right. person I talk to. So right. I have to come up with some other, uh, you know, kind of non-aggressive way of just being able to be nice to people. But so usually I just say it was French or Canadian, you know, because it's basically... Who doesn't like the Canadians? You know, they were. <laughs> well, and, uh, thank you. <laughs> you know, but, but yeah, you know yeah. What I'm I saying? mean, certainly at the time, you guys, <laughs> you guys get away with a lot that we can. You, uh, you, you. I was going to say you. You end up taking some riveting photos of of um, right around this time. Now, this is before Khomeini has come, but there's there are police shooting on protesters, and some people mm-hmm. get injured, some people get killed. You take photos no, of the people. burials of these protesters. No, the, uh, well, and, that was the second day that I there i went out to the cemetery first day you know i get in the hotel i go to this demonstration there's shooting craziness people are killed the next day we went to the cemetery and that's when i i think maybe that was really what crystallized for me that this is you know nobody's kidding around here this is serious you could tell that even at a the funeral was becoming a very and i i couldn't understand what was being uh, said at the funerals, but I could understand how it was being said. Yeah, you say in your book, every burial became a political event. Exactly right, yeah. There was this this ongoing, um, you know, and in fact, the picture of the, the young guy with the bloody hands mm-hmm. was another one of those moments that was just shocking to people. Um, it was the day before Khomeini returned, and... It was a beautiful day, and it was sunshiny, and there were no, not going to really be any big demonstrations, and so it was just like I was thinking, okay, today I'm just going to be a photo artist. Today I'll be the artiste, and I stuffed like three rolls of film in my pocket, and I took one camera. I didn't have all of the paraphernalia that you end up carrying when you're really trying to cover an event. And we're wandering through a park near the university. And what I think had happened was the uh, a group of imperial guards in a truck had driven through this park, and some young kids yelled. I don't know what they yelled at them, but it was obviously pretty insulting. And they fired back, and one of the kids was hit and killed. And so. And this happened any number of times, but this was probably the most um, forceful moment that I'd seen where this happened, where his friends dipped their hands in his blood and paraded around with these bloody hands to show another martyr had fallen. And it was, that was really, uh, you know, everything went from like this beautiful spring day to Mm. just, horrors and and just the flash of a gun gunshot you know just just parenthetically as a sidebar do you, did you ever fear uh, i mean we live in this era where uh, 
um, it's a tough time for journalists, especially foreign mm-hmm. correspondents and reporters. We hear these horror stories of each, you know, every month, every few weeks. There's a, there's another uh, great journalist that has been uh, shot or killed. Or yeah, did mm-hmm. in this situation in Iran at that time, were you ever fearful at yourself? I'm, I mean, I was just trying to think. I don't think I ever really worried about my my own safety from the crowd. I did get. There was a uh, that first week I was there, on I think it was New Year's Eve or New Year's Day, um, a Savak alleged Savak house had been flipped by the crowd. It was like somebody had said this house is where there used to be torturing people, and they had all they had taken all the stuff they found in the house and hung it outside for people to come by and and. You know, parents were bringing their little kids to come and see the stuff. Almost more of a diversion than a, than you know, like a real political event. But it was like, well, let's go see what's really in the Savak house. And there was mm. some creepy stuff. And at one point, a couple of army trucks pulled up to disperse people, and I was not fast enough to run out and run away, and I got grabbed. And even the army, and I, I have to say, they were pretty nice to me. They you know, I had I put my film in my socks, and I was able to get away with the pictures I had shot. But I had to drive around in the cab of this military truck for like an hour before they let me let me go. And I don't actually think I knew where I was when I got out of the truck, but I was just happy not to be under in custody anymore. Mm. There, as you say, it's it's not a given that that you're always going to be safe in this business anymore you know you're there you're you're subject to a lot of uh, downside events that you have no real control over there's what's happening on the ground at that time and then there's what's happening sort of at the top levels with the um the the eventual departure of the shah and mm-hmm. you attend what becomes the final press conference ever in Iran that the Shah and Queen yeah. Farah um, right. preside over on, on, I guess it's New Year's Day. New Year's Day, I think. 79. Yeah, at the Nehavran Palace. What was that like? What can you tell us about that, that moment there in front of the Shah and Queen Farah? Well, that was really interesting because all of a sudden, they bring the press in, and it was, and I say the press, it was maybe, what, 20 or 25 of us, and the sprinkling of TV cameras that were able to do uh, sound, and then a few photographers. We weren't that many. There might have been 20 of us. And all of a sudden, having walked by the outside of that palace several times that week, all of a sudden now I'm on the inside. So everything you see is worthy of a picture. You you know, when we walked through the interior of where I think it was Shah's office, it's like, like, you know, take a picture of the table, take a picture of the chair, take a picture of the lamp, like everything, yeah. because it's not a place that you get to probably ever come back to. Right. So just, you know, try and grab a picture of everything because it's for this one privileged uh, few minutes, you're going to have a chance to see it. And uh, that really was the last time, other than that one photograph that the official photographer did at the airport the day he left, of that one uh, guard who's kind of down on his knees kissing his shoes. Uh, And it's not a very good picture, but it's the moment. You know, sometimes it doesn't have to be a great photograph to really be an important photograph. And, um, Did you take the photo? There's a photo from behind the Shah and Queen Farah where they're talking right. to the press. You, with, you with took that one, right? Yeah yeah, yeah, yeah. And you're right. There doesn't seem to be a lot of press there. But what what did was there a? I mean, could you tell at that moment that this was not going to be a temporary interruption to the Shah's reign, but uh, well, this is a revolution? I think or? I knew when 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 the smart people, you know, the uh, the Iran the hands the the journalists who who had really covered Iran when they started saying like well you know what he's saying he's going on vacation what he's really saying is he's going out of the country and we don't know for how long and that was kind of a big deal so it it, it may not have really sounded like much like well he's going to go on vacation you know he's the Shah he gets to go on vacation whenever he wants 
But it was much more than that. It was the fact that he was leaving the country. And was it tense? No, was the press conference tense? No, I think I don't. I wouldn't say it was actually. I mean, I think we were all just happy to be there, and everybody's mm -hmm. just trying. You know, for the journalists, they're just trying to get a question in that both made sense and maybe had a chance of being answered. Um, well, so the demonstrations keep getting bigger, and mm -hmm. I have a question for you about being a photographer. How, when the size and scope of something like what was happening in Iran at the time is so massive, like say if there's a million people in the streets, how do you try to capture that on camera? It occurs to me that it's hard to show how big things are or how small it's things impossible. are. <laughs> it's right. impossible. It's impossible. Yeah, I mean, you know, every every little grain on your film is one person or five people or something. I mean, you just... It, there's no uh, there's no way to really show the million people what you can maybe show is one person who gives you a sense of what a million people are like or a little group of people who who do that and and that you know that becomes one of the hard things is like how do I how do I show that I do have you don't one try shot. and look for like a rooftop or a scaffolding oh yeah you're out, you're looking for elevation yeah okay. I need to get up higher I don't need to be a hundred feet up I don't need mm. to be 500 feet up if I'm 20 feet up if I'm 10 15 feet up and that's why we would very often in these big um, these big demonstrations you would try and climb up on a truck or a bus and just to get a little bit of Altitude. In fact, you didn't want too much, but if you could get, you know, if you're up to 15, 20 feet, that's enough to really see the massive size of the crowd. Well, there's, a, there's an amazing story I've heard you tell where I think it's four young guys who are part of the revolution who are, who are you know, at a demonstration end up finding out you're a photographer, you're an All American right. photographer, and putting, yeah. they, they lift you well, up we or had, something. I had, we had not had uh, really, I would say, very bad issues with the crowds although there were always a few people who take it upon themselves to act like the the local uh Khomeini police detachment or something you know and it's like no one asked them to do anything but it's like you see in the in the u.s now with people trying to you know make themselves self-important by trying to step in and taking charge and, and in fact at one point uh, one of the, uh, I think it was an Associated Press reporter, someone, someone said to him, can you get your office in Paris to get a message to the Khomeini people out at Neuf Le Chateau to be nice to the press people? Because mm. we're some, you know, we're having some issues with people who are just taking it upon themselves to be in charge of harassing us. So somebody did, and in one of the next messages that came in on cassette tape and was smuggled into the country, it was, there was a, uh, a statement about the foreign press are our friends. Please do everything you can to facilitate their working. And from so Khomeini? Was after, yeah, hmm. from Khomeini. I mean, I'm told. I didn't, I, you know, I, right. I, don't, I never really heard it myself or would be able to tell you that I heard it or understood it but then what did happen the next time I was at one of these big demonstrations and these college kids came over said oh you know welcome to Iran and we hope we can help you is there anything we can do and I I was just starting to say well I'd like to get up a little higher and I didn't even finish the sentence and <laughs> like they all grabbed my legs and just lifted me up about four feet and I was like hey this is perfect <laughs> this was it was great. So, I mean, there are little things like that, these little very human moments yeah, that happen yeah. in the middle of these big events, you know. And, you know, what makes it an event? Well, a lot of different things. But sometimes what makes it very palatable and, in fact, very human are these little moments that you would had absolutely uh, not counted on and are surprised by a little bit. You, you capture a number of images of celebration of sort of euphoria in the streets when the Shah leaves the country. Uh, at the same time, you also take a photo of expats at Mehrabad Airport, hoping to oh, catch right. a flight out of the country. Tell yeah. me about the atmosphere at the airport. Well, that you, you know, there, there were a lot of people who were, uh, 
anti-Shah and who wanted to get rid of the Shah. And, and even though it weren't absolutely even, some of them I'm sure convinced that Khomeini was the right guy, but at least... You know, I, I remember the first week I was there, I went to a party. An Iranian friend invited me to this party. And there was this guy who I've always kind of described as a left bank liberal, you know, kind of a trendy lefty guy who'd gone to the Sorbonne and he right. very well traveled and, you know, and, and he knew everything, right? This guy, all you had to do was ask him and he would tell you that he knew everything. And so... I start talking to this guy at the party, and I and he said, "Well, you know, we're not really uh, hoping that Khomeini will take power. Uh, we're just using Khomeini as the wedge to get rid of right. the Shah, and then we'll take over. We being, I don't know, the Socialist Party of Iran or sure. whoever yeah, it was." Yeah. But and I said, "Geez, you really think that the religious are just going to give up if they've been the ones that actually?" Uh, are able to get rid of the Shah by by their actions, that they're just going to turn it over to you. And he looked at me with this like look of absolute disgust, and he <laughs> said, "Well, you obviously know nothing about Iranian politics." And I mean, I I'm sure this guy left Iran like the week after Khomeini took over, and has not been back since then. He's still stewing in Paris. Right. I don't know. It was. It was hard to, you know, and I was certainly not a, an Iran hand, as they, you know, would call like a China hand or a Cuba hand. These reporters who spend the better part of their lives really immersing themselves and studying a particular place or scenario, whether it be, you know, Russia or Syria. It could be, you know, any anywhere. I mean, where that becomes what you are all about and. And yet sometimes you just, even somebody like me, you can feel something that's going on and you just trust your judgment. Yeah, let me let me come back to that. That's an interesting thing for you to say. But just in terms of the airport, I'm thinking it's, a, yeah, it's an interesting yeah. moment, this, right? Because, again, this is not the hostage crisis. This is an Argo. This is like, you know, right. before that where people are kind of hedging their bets. I mean, they can see things are not headed in they're, they're, well, they're headed in a certain direction. And it's, and mm -hmm. if you're, if you're an American or if you're, you know, a Western person in Iran, or if you're a, a friendly to the monarchy or the Shah, that the, you know, right. you, you're starting to feel like you better get out of town. And right. is this going to work out for you or is it not? Yeah. Yeah. And the, the airport does, looks less like chaos in your photo and more just like sadness or something. Well, the thing was, we had to, we we would have to go and ship our film virtually every day, or maybe three, four times a week. And anyway, we'd get up early and go out to the airport. And we, you know, by the second week I was there, I think uh, the civil, uh, a lot of the civil stuff had broken down, and you could just walk into the airport and walk into the departure lounge. So there, they weren't really checking for. They were checking for tickets, but they weren't checking for security and you had to have a passport stamped or anything. You could just walk in there. And that's where we, uh, one of my good friends, a, a Newsweek photographer, Olivier Rabot, we would go in and look around for somebody that would take our film out to either Paris or London mm. and being able to get the film shipped. And then somebody would meet that person at the airport and transfer it to a plane to new york and wow, that's right this is pre-internet pre you can't you can't just absolutely send images no, right you, yeah. you had to get the film out that was the deal but the thing was we would walk into the uh, departure lounge in that picture you're talking about it's really a look of of sadness and distress on the faces of almost everybody in that room yeah. and yeah. we would we would sort of have a little game about well uh who do you think we can trust with our film so that was, in addition to the actual photographing, that was another one of those things that we had to deal with almost every day, probably right, three, right, four, right. maybe five times a week we had to go to the airport. And that picture, I have to say, is, is one to me that really tells volumes about what was happening with not even so much the Iranian population, but, but all those people that had been living in Iran, uh, and maybe in the oil business or in, in antiquities or whatever, 
and here they were no longer feeling like this was home. Yeah. So you saw a lot of very down faces there. Let me ask you about maybe your most remarkable work um, uh, of the, in this period, which is the, the photos that, these riveting photos you take of, of Ayatollah Khomeini. And when Khomeini returns to Iran in early 79, he, he sets up office in a school uh, mm -hmm. and and you and there are about I don't know 20,000 people outside the window you somehow get into the room with him I mean there are photos where you've got to be I don't know like a couple of meters away from him you know 10 mm -hmm. 10 feet away how did you get in the room well that is a story of uh, basically just sticking to your guns to try and make something happen and not giving up um, they they had assigned a economics professor to be the liaison with the foreign press. And unfortunately, he was a very nice guy, but he knew nothing really about how to deal with the press or about how to do briefings or well, what kind of stuff can I tell you about what Khomeini said today that would make a, a good story. Um, he just He was just like stuck with this job and and I started going to the school because uh, they would bring these groups of people into, into the playground of the school, uh, you know, five, ten thousand 10,000 people at a time. I didn't even know what the numbers were, but a big crowd. And it was like a heart valve. You'd like, you'd enter from one side, you'd kind of get all these people in there, and then Khomeini would come to the window and wave and kind of, I don't know, everyone or just be himself at that window and everybody just wanted to see him up close and personal and even if you were in the back of the playground you know maybe 60 or 80 feet away you would still see him and you you felt like that was really you know part of what was the, the ongoing struggle you know like twice an hour maybe they would bring a group in they would he would come to the window for a few minutes wave a little bit and then they would open the gate on the other side and they'd kind of push everybody out. And then the valves, the gates on the other side would open and another several thousand right. people would come in. And they kind of did that all day. And he was basically just holding court in this little classroom that was about 10 feet by 10 feet, if that, maybe not even that big. Um, but that's where the window was. And it was in a place where people could, could see him when he came to the window. You know, the first few days, all we did was take pictures of him coming to the window. And we did it from down down low, from up on high, from in the back, <laughs> as close as you could get. I mean, everywhere. It was like, and finally, after a couple of days, it was like, yeah, we need to do something else. So I started going to these little uh, press briefings, which really weren't much of a briefing, but the uh, this professor would be there, and he would... Uh, he would usually take a few questions, but didn't ever really have any answers. Nice guy, but not very effectual. But after a few days, most of the press people stopped coming to his little meetings. But I kept going, and at the end of every one, as I would walk out, I would say, uh, we've got great pictures of Imam from here and from there, but there must still be one very good picture to take inside. Mm. And he would just say, well, it'll come tomorrow. And so I'd come back the next day, and I'd give him my whole thing again. And he would say, well, please, come back tomorrow. And then, I don't know, I think just being a nice, honest, look, face-looking guy and looking sincere and always coming back and always trying to make this happen, like the fourth or fifth day, I came in there. And instead of saying, come back tomorrow, he said, just a minute. <laughs> <laughs> wow. It's like there's a world of difference between just a minute and come back tomorrow. Yeah, yeah. You know, you're always hoping that there would be some little chance that something would happen. So in the end, um, he came back from having gone to talk to some people, and he said, come with me. And all of a sudden, having been around this school now for like a week and a half or two weeks, all of a sudden I'm walking into the school. And this was a whole other adventure and then i'm as we're walking along i'm checking all my cameras making sure there's film in there that the film is you know if you if you 
would be going in to do something like this, you wanted to be sure that you had just loaded a fresh roll of film because, you know, we get very spoiled now in the era of you can, t on one little memory card in your camera or your phone, you can take uh, 20,000 pictures right, or some right. incredible number. And, you know, in the era of film, 36 pictures. That was what a roll of film was. And so you wanted to make sure you had a fresh roll of film in every camera. And I usually had three or four cameras. But still, that, I mean, that's 144 pictures. That is not, in today's world, that's pretty, right, right. pretty minimal. So we get down, to, we walk down this hallway. And, and, by, the, and by the way, you're not looking yeah. at the photos on, on a screen uh, as you take them. <laughs> no, no, no. <laughs> right. you're, you're, you're hoping, you're, you're, you're you're hoping, hoping you have a picture. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. And you won't know for another week or 10 days right. uh, if you have a picture. But we get we get down to this hallway and there's a door and he said, please, can you take your shoes off? Now, I was still wearing my Vietnam era combat boots, which were these high ankle laced up boots, which take, you know, five minutes to get on and five <laughs> minutes to get off. And right. that particular day, I think I had them off in about 15 seconds. <laughs> it was... Right. Just like, get rid of these shoes. And the door opens, and there is this moment of Kalkali reaching down with a little tray to get the teacup. It was just like the most improbable for. So, this is a photo. Of, let me describe this. You take a photo yeah. of Khomeini is seated. I mean, people might have seen this photo, but this is taken yeah. by you. He's seated. There's a man kneeling to take the teacup that Khomeini mm -hmm. is putting on the. And that, it turns out that man is Ayatollah Khal Khali, who will become a notorious figure in history. Yeah. I'm assuming you didn't have any idea who that was at the time, right? Didn't. Didn't. Now, the guy I was with, I was with a French guy who was kind of connected a little bit. He. I think he was a friend of the daughter of Eshragi, who was the other one of the mullahs who's standing there, the the sort of tallest uh, guy who's standing there on the left. Uh, but he, I mean, we were just like, uh, you know, I'm just, and what do you do as a photographer? All you do is keep your mouth shut and shoot pictures. Hmm. And I shot it in black and white, and I grabbed the other camera, and I shot it in color. And then I shot some more. And then within about 15 seconds, like, this is when, as a photographer, all you wish for is to not be noticed. Yeah. You just yeah. want to be invisible. And I kind of crawled back to the far corner, the opposite corner of that little room. And as soon as my back hit the corner, I just slid down and just into a sitting position and just tried to become invisible. And then after five minutes, Khomeini gets up, he goes to the window, and then I'm up real close to him, shooting right over his shoulder. Now, for the first time, I'm seeing what it's like from his point of view with these screen thousands of screaming people that are outside in the, in the playground of the school, but now I'm seeing what he sees instead of looking at him. And, you know, it's like, it's one of those things you just feel a certain not even accomplishment, but it's just like a, a certain um, like gratitude that you're able to have a vision of what something's like and that rarely, but it does happen, that you're actually able to make it happen and see what's, see what's going on. So I was... Um, Did he ever acknowledge you? I mean, you have tremendous no, proximity no. to him. Did he? No, I know, no, and I just... No, and I was perfectly happy. You know, it's like if he had said, you know, what's your favorite pizza, I would have been perfectly willing to engage him. But unless I really think I can say something that will change something to make it better, I just shut up and let things happen. Mm. And that's, that's always been, for me, that's always been a, uh, a good way to operate and i think that's how you know as photographers that's how we want to operate i, I guess the, there's uh, the, there's moments david when you're in the middle of something and you take a photo and you don't know that it's necessarily going to be a an iconic historic moment and then there's moments mm -hmm. that you do know and i'm assuming this was a moment you knew well i you, i i really thought that teacup picture was going to be something but again i who knew you know i'm just I'm hoping, and I hope it's in focus, and I hope I, you know, I hope I didn't screw it up. Mm. That's really where you are in so many of these things, because you don't know what you've got. You're not, you're, the film has to get developed 
uh, 8,000 miles away before you even know if you have a picture or not. The one almost hilarious thing is that after he'd been in there for like, I don't know, we're in there for like 15 minutes, he gets up and walks out the door and they said something like he's gone to do prayers or something. But I didn't want to leave, so I just stayed there. Hmm. And then like, I don't know, 10 minutes later, he came back into this little room and I had just put my camera bag down without really thinking near the door and I have this picture, it was like another three inches. He could have easily tripped on my camera bag. Anybody <laughs> would have, because it's just right. sitting there. Right. I look at this picture. You could have changed and, history if had he, that have had he tripped badly well. enough. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> that wouldn't have ended well. But it's just, you know, you're, you're just trying to get through every minute and maximize your chances for making a picture. Right. Finally, I, I have to ask you, I mean, this is... I feel like I'm I'm uh, leading up to the the <laughs> the money shot. If you'll excuse the the euphemism, but the this iconic close up photo of Khomeini, um, I, I don't even need. I mean, we'll put it up on our screen for those who are listening to this on on YouTube or Instagram. But but you, you don't even need to because you already know the photo if you're listening to us right now, wherever you are in the world. It's that photo of Khomeini with the terrifying piercing eyes mm -hmm. uh, it, it really David this photo has come to define him it's like the Che Guevara p uh, picture that people wear on mm -hmm. t-shirts or something I mean this is the the Khomeini picture do you do you remember taking this photo I remember that I we were it was taken at a press conference where I think his son was if it may have been uh, no Yazdi was maybe translating, but there because they were taking some questions in English and French. But it was it was a few TV lights were up, and then the lighting was kind of harsh. And you know this was a a guy who didn't have like I do actually have from that uh, inside the room series. I have one picture where he's laughing. I don't know that it's ever been published. I'm not even sure if it's in the book, but there is one shot. I'm not sure I've ever seen a picture like, of him laughing. This is a guy who was not known to be a great, you know, cut up. You know, he mm. didn't spend a lot of time laughing. He was, or if he did, we never saw it. Mm. Um, but I have that one shot. But yeah, this was taken at a news conference, and he's looking pretty stern. And I mean, I mean he's talking about... Uh, you know, these are sort of grave issues of state and religion, and he's looking pretty serious. I don't think he tried to look any more serious than he was. It's a guy who pretty much looked That's like his face. that yeah. all the time. Yeah. yeah. And there is this, you know, I had a, a doubler on my 200 millimeter, and it's a pretty strong picture. Yeah. Was it that close up when you took it, or is that zoomed in on no, I mean, I, I, with the, the doubler, the little 2X doubler, I think I was probably, you know, 15 or 18 feet away. I wasn't that far away, but maybe even a little closer than that. But yeah, just trying to fill the frame with his face. That's what I was trying to do. It's remarkable. It's, re it's, it's remarkable. What What is it like to have been the guy who has taken a photo that goes the it goes viral in the previous uh, sense of the word you know not necessarily the the cyberspace version but it's a, it's become the iconic photo well you know i have i haven't seen it on a t-shirt yet but i'm sure somebody probably put it on a t-shirt some some point without telling me maybe not a positive t-shirt maybe no a, yeah, well maybe i mean a, it's just but everybody uh, reads into it what they want you know that's the thing it's it's uh, you know pro Shah people would look at it and say, oh, this is terrible. And pro Khomeini people would look at it and say, look how strong he looks. You know, hmm. it's, it's people interpret can very often take the same photograph and have many different interpretations. Do you, do you look back at this, this period? It, I'm wondering if, if you ever, you know, uh, uh, like a, a, as a musician, I, I would I'd listen back to an old record and go, oh, I could have done this song differently or something. Do you ever, mm -hmm. do you, especially when you're a witness to history the way you are, do you ever look back at a period like this and go, this is something I wish I had done? And if that, and if so, well, what would it have been? Well, I think what I can tell you is that I'd been there about uh, six weeks 
I had said, Licks, man, I am so burned out. I need to R and R. I'm going to go to Paris for the weekend, and I'll be back Monday. So Friday, I get on a plane. I go to Paris. Saturday, all hell breaks loose in my absence. And I thought, oh my god, I got to get back there. And so when I had a uh, a chance to get on this plane, I got back, and all the press was at the airport waiting to get all their film and TV camera footage on this plane that's going to turn around and go right back to Paris oh. and distribute all the, the the film. And I stayed on for another week or so, and then finally, I guess on day 44, I left. There's no script written. This is life just happening at the speed at which life takes place. Yeah. There's no script to read. There's no absolute assurance that anything's going to happen one way or the other. And to me, that is always a um, one of the things I think that drives me to want to be a photographer is just like, well, let's see where this this story unfolds itself to. A final question for you, and I, you already talked about the the left bank uh, uh, guy mm -hmm. with the, <laughs> the 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 left wing hipster guy who thought that you yeah. were um, so proletarian. I mean, he was know. right in that I didn't know anything, but I think I knew more than he did. Yeah. <laughs> well, on that note, and yeah. and um, yeah. and and perhaps to underscore what you said was a feeling that you had looking back now. Yeah. Look, I mean, obviously there are still uh, Khomeinists or pro uh, regime people who will celebrate the revolution, but for the most part, certainly in the diaspora, there are so many folks who regret their roles in the revolution, given what has happened and the regime. I know a lot power. of people who, yeah. Yeah. W was there any indication for you at the time that this could, I mean, you're, because you're an outsider too, right? I mean, you're capturing history. It's a little different from somebody who's very, an Iranian who's super involved in it. Was there any indication that this could go all very wrong? I don't know. Uh, I don't think I ever thought it would get this bad. I feel terrible about it because, like, you know, Iran is a country with, physically, it's pretty interesting. There are so many smart people. There are so many talented people. And, and yet, the world is increasingly just becoming so controlled by people who don't want to listen to anybody else. I think that, unfortunately, is the issue. You have people that don't want to give anything. And this is certainly one of those places. And I'm sure, I mean, I have, I have a number of friends who really hate what's happened and they've emigrated and living in, I'm sure some in Canada, but a lot of them in the States. And, you know, they, in, in many ways, I've had a number of people who are now maybe in their, I don't know, 50s probably, who have said to me that my book is kind of like their college or high school yearbook, the way we see the yearbook, which is like, well, here's the story of my time in school. Yeah, but like yeah. this is, instead of time in school, this was like the revolution that we lived through. And your, you know, your book kind of touches all those bases yeah. in so many ways. Yeah. So I don't know. I mean, I, 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 you know, one hopes and one wishes that at some point it could be the level of dispute could, could lower and you could just be able to kind of resume more normal relations. And I certainly hope that somehow can happen. I don't know how that does happen, but it would be nice. David Burnett, I, I thank you so much for this today. I really appreciate it. Well, thank you. It's uh, I appreciate talking to some, <laughs> somebody who really looked at all the pictures. That's mm -hmm. very, uh, not everybody does, so I appreciate that. It was my much. pleasure. Thank you. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Thanks. David Burnett is an award-winning American photographer and the author of 44 Days, Iran and the Remaking of the World. David Burnett joined us from New York City today. This is full time for the Rook Media Series, The Contemporary History of Iran, Part 33. Please check out our regular editions of Rook and all things related at rookmedia.com. That's the website, rookmedia.com. You can catch up on the video, uh, funnies, 
different guests, different programming at rookmedia.com. Thanks to the amazing team who make Rook Media happen. Talented Anahita, Super Parisa, Smart Pega, Ponsa the Artist, Savvy Roham, Ahai Mehrdad, the fabulous Keon, Captain Reza, and Groovy Shia. Thank you to all of you out there for supporting us and sharing our content. Please subscribe if you've not done so already. You can find me on Instagram at Gian Gomeshi. Mizun Bashin.